Welcome to another VO Radio Show. My name's Andrew Peters, and up in Sydney... Is Robbo, as usual. How are you? I'm very well, and you? Man, I'm not too bad. Thank you very much. I hear you've uh, made a new purchase. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah I, as everybody knows, I, I have a home studio, work from home, um, but I got a gig uh, once a fortnight mixing some TV episodes, but they needed me to come to them. So I don't normally mix in headphones, so I didn't own a pair of headphones I could mix in. So I've been out and purchased myself a, a nice set of KRKs that I take with me to mix in. So um, mm. in fact, I'm modelling them right now. Oh, they <laughs> look lovely. So I'm told. <laughs> If anybody's listening who has a favourite pair of reference headphones, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, yeah. Just drop us a line and tell us what you use because uh, everyone's got their own thing going. And I, mm. you know, obviously from stuff we've done in the past where we worked with Robert Marshall and George Whittam, both said that I was getting a bit of bleed out of my headphones, which I adamantly denied and said it wasn't me. It wasn't mm. my headphones. Mm. Uh, it was my headphones. And uh, so I went up. More, more importantly, I, I'm not sure it's just the headphones. I think it might actually have something to do with the headphone volume. Yes. We- <laughs> you could be right there. You could be right. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Those poor old ears of mine have been tortured over the years and they continue yeah, it's not to just be the so. Headphones. It's not just the headphones that are bleeding, it's the ears underneath <laughs> yeah, as well. that's right. That's right. Yeah, yes. I can feel the warm trickle down the side of my neck on either side. But uh, I bought a pair of those extreme isolation headphones for that very reason, so I can mm. still hear <laughs> what's going on without, <laughs> without um, you know, bleeding too without much. Without turning up your hearing aid. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just that horrible squeal, feedback squeal. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the joys of getting uh, older. Don't we love yeah, it? Yeah, that's right, exactly. But yeah. I, I, it's funny, though, you mentioned that because it's one thing having not having a lot of experience mixing in headphones. It's one thing I do find... Um, every second Tuesday when I'm doing this gig is that by the end of the day, not only are my ears fatigued, but my my brain's fatigued. It's 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 a completely different sensory thing mixing in headphones. By the, you just it frazzles you by the end of the day. It's weird. I mean, mm. I get a headache wearing a hat. Yeah, right. So yeah, I'm, <laughs> so I'm not much shop with you know tight headphones particularly. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's part and parcel of the gig we do. But um, yeah, wow, it was it's really been an eye opener. Yeah. It is an eye opener. Now, talking about, um, well, actually, we're not talking about this stuff. I did an interview with uh, a guy called Mike Cooper, and Mike and I have some strange things in common, which you'll find out uh, when you have a listen to the interview. But Mike's an expat Brit who now lives in North Carolina, making a living selling his voice. On the line from North Carolina is uh, not the accent you would expect. It's actually an Englishman, Mike Cooper. How are you doing, Mike? Hi, Andrew. I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. We actually do have one strange thing in common, apart from what we do for a living, uh, and that is a a town in England called Hemel Hempstead. (laughs) That's right. I lived there about getting on for 25 years ago at this point. Wow. Well, I lived there getting on for 43 years ago (laughs) at this point. Yeah, I was still way up in the Midlands in Wolverhampton at that point. So what took you to Hemel Hempstead? Because it's not what you call a, um, a creative hub or anything. It was the beginning of my journey south. So when I left the Midlands, the first place that I went was to work for uh, what was then called SSVC, which is the the British Forces Broadcasting Service. And I was uh, an announcer come transmission controller for Forces Television, uh, which in those days was still called SSVC Television, a rather cumbersome name. These days it's all bundled together under the BFBS banner, which I think is, is better known by a lot of people. Uh, and and that put me out in the Chalfonts to the west of London, and I ended up dating someone who lived in Hemel Hempstead, and that was how I ended up living in Hemel Hempstead. And then from there, I moved into London and never really looked back. So you, were, I didn't even realise that uh, the British um, forces had their own television and radio network. Yeah, uh, it's been going since the late seventies, early eighties. It's very different now to what it was when I worked there. But we were doing uh, satellite transmission to to various parts of the world. Um, We were sending tapes off to the Falklands still. I mean, I don't know how much of that still goes on. Uh, I am in occasional contact with people who are still involved, and they they tell me that it's it's become um, a, a different beast again at this point. But it was great training for me because it enabled me to use a lot of the radio 
training that I already had, um, which I then took on into various other roles in the future. It was it was good fun. I did it for about two years and then decided time for the next thing. But the other thing, of course, um, in Britain, which is unusual to pretty well everywhere else, is hospital radio. Do you know I was tempted and for a long time it looked like that would be the way it worked and I never actually ended up doing any hospital radio, which I appreciate makes me something of an anomaly in terms of, of radio at least. Um, the way I worked it was I did I did some work experience at my local station in Wolverhampton, which, which at that time was Beacon Radio, which was a great station. And then from there, when that didn't lead to anything much, I, I was 15 at the time, I, I moved on, I did work experience for another station called BRMB in Birmingham. And then from there, I ended up, you know, my options were running thinner at this point, and I ended up going to the BBC local radio station in Birmingham, which was Radio WM at Pebble Mill. Uh, and that was what really gave me my start. I started out by helping out with the Saturday afternoon sports program. They paid me something ridiculous, like £10. My father thought I was mad because it cost me more than that to get there and back. But I kind of knew that sooner or later this would lead to a job. And sure enough, about six months later, I went back for some more work experience. Um, and the, one of the producers marched me into the program organizer's office uh, and said, you need to ask Andy for a job. And so I did. And Andy said, what a surprise, there is a job. And that was how I got my start. So I left school at just turned 17, I think, uh, and went to work for the BBC. And it was the first of three exposures to the BBC over the course of my career to date. Uh, the other two being a director for television news for BBC World News, and then 10 years with the World Service on the radio as a newsreader and announcer before I left to come to America. Wow. Okay. I, I didn't know you did that sort of stuff. Though. That's really interesting. I, I, I went off for a period of travel, actually. It was when I first visited Australia. Uh, my ex is Australian. We'd spent four months doing travel. We'd been around Southern Africa, and then we spent two months in Australia visiting his family, uh, who were split variously between places like Hobart, um, Brisbane, and a bunch of other places too. And I got back to London in February of 2005, and I really wasn't sure what I was going to do next. And a colleague and friend of mine at the time sat me down over a cup of coffee and said, much as the other person had said, you need to go and talk to my friend, little Paul, who looks after the announcers at the BBC World Service. So I went and saw little Paul and little Paul showed more interest than I expected. And he said, so, you know, do you want to be a newsreader? And I said, but I've never read the news, Paul. And he said, Shh, don't tell everybody that. We'll be fine. And I, with a little bit of voice training to kind of mould me in the direction that they wanted. Um, hey presto, I became a BBC news reader. And you know what, Andrew, as probably of all the things I've done, it was one of the one things that I never got tired of. Whenever I wandered into that studio and the red light went on and you knew that there were millions of people all over the world listening and that you were being charged with this job of delivering not just news, but news that they trusted. I took that as a great responsibility and I never got tired of doing that right up until the day I left. Of course, it gives you a amazing training um, for sight reading. So if you wanted to do any long form voiceover, you're, you're well set. Yeah. I mean, my sight reading skills were always pretty good, but they improved immeasurably over that 10 years. To be sitting in the middle of a news bulletin and somebody comes in and thrusts a bit of paper at you that's got an African name or a Thai name or something on it that you haven't had chance to rehearse and to be expected to get it out pretty much right first time is great training. I would be hopeless as a newsreader, <laughs> quite frankly, because um, I look at him and go, <laughs> yeah, okay, no idea what that means. Um, or what it is. Yeah. So what was the leap from um, being a newsreader into uh, voiceover? Well, voiceover was something that I'd always kind of done. Um, even that first job that I had out of school with the BBC, one of my responsibilities was to make trails or promos. Uh, so that was really my first job. And then from there, I mean, when I joined Forces Television, that was as an announcer. So again, I was kind of the station voice or one of the station voices, network voice, a, a booth announcer, if that's what you call it. Um, and I did that for um, commercial TV stations in the UK. My local ITV station was Central in Birmingham. And then I moved down to London and I started doing it for Carlton, which was the ITV contractor in London. So I'd always done periods of it and I'd always had periods where I dipped into it and thought, oh, I'm going to do voiceover full time rather than it being 
just broadcast work. But it didn't really happen for me as a full-time thing until 2008. And I'd moved from the BBC again at this point. I was This was in the period where I was working as uh, a newsreader for the World Service, but I was freelance. And I was also freelancing for Sky Television as a news director for Sky News. And I'd been doing that for about two or three years. And it had become probably two-thirds to three-quarters of my income. And then in the middle of December, I was taken to one side and informed that Sky would no longer be employing freelance news directors after Christmas. (laughs) Um, So with about two weeks' notice, I suddenly looked at two-thirds to three-quarters of my income evaporating overnight, and I thought, I have to do something here. Now, Around the same time, uh, in another bit of good fortune, I'd wandered into our basement wardrobe, which was lined with coats and shirts and just about everything else you could think of down either side. And a little light bulb had gone off in my mind, and I'd thought, it sounds really good in here. This would make a really good voiceover booth. I wonder if you can do voiceover from home. And that was how it started. And I went away and had a look online and found out that actually you could do voiceover from home. And there were even um, a few websites beginning to spring up to enable you to do that. And it really all came out of that. And within within a few months, voiceover was pretty much all I was doing. I was still doing the world service stuff. Uh, I was still doing an odd bit of news directing here and there. It hadn't completely dried up. But certainly over the course of that year, 2008, it really became my full-time job. So uh, yeah, I'm coming up on 10 years now. What was the uh, reason for moving to the States? So in 2010, in January of 2010, that, that previous relationship with the Aussie had kind of run its course. We'd, we'd broken up once. We'd got back together to see whether or not we had anywhere else still to go. He'd announced back in the October that he was going to pay a visit to the family in Oz in February of 2010 and said, are you going to come? And I said, well, I don't really know because I don't know where we're going to be at that point. And it's a big trip to plan and a a big investment of time and money if we're not together at that point. So why don't you do that? And maybe I'll do my own thing. And the long and short of it is I ended up taking a trip to Florida in January of 2010. I met somebody while I was here. We decided we would go for it. Mark, my now husband, came to London, was in London with me for about four months. We realized that to to make it work on an ongoing basis, we were going to f- need to find a way of being physically together rather than separated by 5,000 miles or whatever it was. Um, yeah. So we got married. We came back to the States at a time when gay marriage meant nothing outside the state that you were married in and very little even in the state that you were married in. Um, so we came back, got married in the States, which meant that Mark was able to settle with me in the UK. And then after about four years of that, the US government, the previous administration, um, changed the law and I was able to get a green card. And we said, you know, we should probably do something about that before the wind changes direction. And of course, here we are three years after that, and the wind could change direction at any time, which is why I'm now in the process of applying for my US citizenship, um, because I've spent the last three years, three years this month, actually, building a life here, which I enjoy very much. And I don't really want that to be at the whim of what somebody decides are the rights of green card holders, which can be changed pretty much overnight. Yes, well, the current administration is uh, volatile, to say the least. That's polite. But it's interesting because you talk about gay marriage. That is still on the table in Australia, can you believe? Yeah, and that really surprises me because... I've always, and I think most of us, uh, certainly looking from Europe, always thought of Australia as being a little more progressive than maybe we were. Um, And then, you know, a a big block of time under a Labour government, things changed very quickly, not overnight in the UK, but we did gain a lot of that ground in a fairly short space of time. Gay marriage was quite late coming. And in fact, at the time where we applied for my green card to come here, we were on a very short list of people who were eligible because the American government 
didn't recognize civil partnerships and to the best of my knowledge still doesn't. So we went to an immigration equality meeting in London in December of 2013 where there were about 60 people and it was all laid out for us how this would work and the room fell very silent when it came to the eligibility criteria because we were one of only two couples in the room who'd been married in a jurisdiction where it was marriage and not civil partnership. Everybody else wasn't eligible and had to either go away and get married or wait until the UK brought in same-sex marriage, which I think happened either the following year or two years later, um, at which point they became eligible. But it made it really easy for me because it meant the wait for a green card for me was about three months. So you've been in the States for three years. You're also not just living in the States, but you're in North Carolina on in a country property. Yeah. It's actually even more intriguing how you you built this career and you continue with your career. It's very strange. Yeah. Um if you said to me 5 years ago, you know what, you're going to be living in a log cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains and you'll have 25 chickens and a couple of goats. Um I would have probably thought you were mad, but here we are, and I do in fact live in a log cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and we do in fact have 23 hens, two roosters, and a couple of pet goats. Um, I could never have seen that coming, to be honest. And certainly, <laughs> although I always, I kind of thought I would end up living in America, I kind of always thought that. I was never really sure how it would happen or under what circumstances it might happen, but I kind of always thought it might. But I would never have expected that this would be my reality. I think I'd always thought it would be Boston or New York or L.A., not Asheville, North Carolina, and 25 minutes out of town up a hill somewhere. But I joke about it. I say I have my 17-yard commute because what we did for my studio was we we sectioned off. We have a two-story garage, which is a, a separate building to the house. Um, and so we took a portion of the upstairs of that and turned it into a studio for me. So we have some separation because Mark works from home as well. We both need some noise separation. And I always joke that I have my 17-yard commute. I have a very similar commute. It's very workable, isn't it? It is. The only downside of all this is the isolation. That's one thing that I must admit, sometimes it does get to you a bit and you think, I I wish I was working somewhere where there were other people around I could actually talk to or go and have a coffee with. I have a love-hate relationship with that idea. Um, There are certainly times where I think working with producers, seeing other people the other side of the glass, seeing how they reacted, seeing how they... getting direction rather than just being sent a script and asked to deliver it back with often no feedback whatsoever unless there's something wrong. So there is a bit of that that I miss. On the other hand, when I set up my studio in London, I was convinced that being 20 minutes from the West End that I would be spending every working weekday drinking coffee in Soho and waiting for the phone to ring. And it never really worked out that way. And I don't think it does for many people these days. Uh, You know, the, the Soho sessions were a nice treat, but they certainly weren't what I built my business on. The interesting thing here is Asheville is a small city and then there are a few other towns dotted around the outside which we we kind of almost tongue-in-cheek called the Asheville metro area, which brings it to about 200,000 people. But it's, a, it's still a small town. But when I put the feelers out before we came here to check the place out the first time, um, I reached out to what surprisingly was a group of seven or eight voiceovers who I just found online who were in the Asheville area. They all turned up for my birthday when we came out in April three and a half years ago to check the place out. And so we already had this little built-in voiceover circle before we even moved here. And most of those people I'm still in touch with and we we still have ongoing friendships. So there are people around that I can talk to. Um, We also have a couple of studios very near town, both of which I'd been working with before we moved here and hadn't even realised were in the Asheville area. Uh, I started working for Procom, um, which is a studio that does a lot of work remotely, and I'd been with them since, I think, 2009 or 2010. And whenever I saw their address, it always said, whatever it is, I think it says... uh, Fairview or Fletcher or wherever it is, North Carolina. And I was smart enough to know that North Carolina is a big place. North Carolina is about the size of England. And so I had no idea that Fletcher was 
you know, a 20 minute drive from downtown Asheville or that either of these studios, the other one being Sunspots, were going to be pretty much in my area when I moved here. I live out of Melbourne, but I do commute backwards and forwards. But down here, I don't know any other voiceover person. Yeah, I mean, one one of the things that I that I find works for me is the voiceover conferences, which are a big thing here. There's a lot more focus on the idea that you need to be training and coaching and so on, and th- that's another argument that we can get into another time. But what it does do is it, I think it creates a more engaged community. And so there are a bunch of different voiceover events that go on in different corners of the country and move around the place. Uh, of course, the biggest one of the lot is VO Atlanta. Um, unfortunately, Atlanta is about a four, four and a half hour drive from here, which sounds to an Englishman like a terribly long way to be driving for anything. But <laughs> once you readjust, and I guess it might be the same in Oz. Oh, it is absolutely, yeah. And then going in the other direction, slightly closer, Charlotte is about a two and a half hour drive from here. So um, Lisa Biggs, who runs Voxy Ladies, um, is now based in Charlotte. She's always been in this kind of area. She was in Asheville for a while, and I, I think she might be heading back this way. These kind of things give me some options that I can drive to, which is great. But then the other things like WovoCon generally happens in Las Vegas. It's easy enough to get to by plane, as is just about anything else that you want to. So I I tend to see my American VO colleagues at least once or twice a year and catch up. And because time goes by so quickly when you're you're in your middle age, as you know, um, (laughs) it doesn't really feel like more than five minutes has passed since I saw any of them the last time. And because we have social media, the world feels like a much smaller place. I do wonder what doing a move like this would have been like before all of that. I mean, you know about that. You did it. Um, but, the, the, you know, the home studio thing here is, uh, you know, there's not a huge amount of people who are well set up. I did notice that with the Australian market. It does seem very much to be people going into studios in Sydney and not a huge amount of other stuff going on. Um And I don't know if that's a cultural thing or whether that's just because of the fact that once you get away from the cities in Australia, things get sparse pretty quickly. You're probably right on both counts. I think um, there is an historic attitude towards studios. And I must admit, you know, in a different world, I actually do like going into a studio. I do like being directed. But like you, most of my clients are not here. They're elsewhere. Yeah. And I also think, I mean... My experience of it with Australia, and you, I'd be grateful for your input, actually. I've tried a couple of times to break into the VO market as a British voice in Australia. It strikes me that there is some cultural prejudice there, and I don't know if it's a, a push back against the mother country and, you, you know, we, we want things to sound Australian or, or what it is, but there's certainly a lot less of an appetite as far as I've seen, uh, for, for British voiceover in the Australian market than there is even in America, where it's already a niche thing. There are British voices here, and they work. I think it's more a geographic thing. Um, it's Once again, it's the, uh, we like to have someone in the studio. And the time difference is a, is a big thing as well. You know, if you're 9 or 10 or 11 hours ahead or different, that can be a challenge. If you add complication to a, to a session, then it's probably not going to happen. And I think when you start going, okay, well, is a home studio? Is his studio okay? What, what's the time difference there? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, look, forget it. Going to call <laughs> so-and-so. He's a Brit. It's interesting. But again, there hasn't been the interest that, that I think any of us perhaps expected there might be. Yeah, and, and probably, there probably isn't that much work. I mean, I don't hear British voices. And I think it's because Australians, uh, Australian and Brits... I, you know, I mean, obviously the accent's different, but it's not that different. It's not like an American and a Brit. So when you work in America as an English voice, it's completely different. But when yeah. you work as an English guy in Australia, it's not that different, unless you've got a e by gum, you know, lad. Uh, you know, you know. I get asked more often if I'm an Australian here than I do get asked if I'm English. Yeah. And for me, because I grew up in England... Um, you probably hear me as an Australian, I would imagine, because you've got an English ear. Yeah, I hear I hear it in the vowels, yeah. Yeah. But here, I'm kind of like that sort of what we used to call in the good old days, the mid-Atlantic kind of <laughs> voice, which serves me well, I have to say. Yeah. But I think uh, in, in America, I find interesting because um, uh, for me, I would find it probably quite difficult to uh, work in it. There is no Aussie channel, you know, so... Um, 
there's nowhere for me to fit or any Australian to fit particularly. Yeah, I mean, I'm still working out where I fit here, I have to be honest. And sometimes it's not the places you expect. Um, but I'm grateful. I mean, my, my business is building nicely. Um, I've made a point over the last few years of um, making good personal contacts with my American counterparts um, because a, a small but significant amount of my work comes to me through other voice talent referring me. And a lot of the time we're in competition with each other, but you take yourself and you put yourself in a market where you're not in competition with anybody, but you can be an asset to them. And that has has proven quite useful for me. Um, and I think for them, because, you know, it looks great if you can refer somebody who's good. It, it reflects well on you and on the other person. But that, again, comes down to it's nurturing those personal relationships, those personal contacts. That's why I think it is important, uh, certainly for me, to show up at things like conferences and and make sure that my face is seen um, and that I'm I'm seen as being an engaged part of the community. Community, yeah, but yeah. Anyway, now I'm curious about your studio because uh, you mentioned before that you did a bit of techie stuff in the early days. Has that helped you set up your studio at home? I think it gave me a, a good idea of where to start from because my broadcast background comes from a time where we still built proper studios. I find it <laughs> a little sad in some ways that we spent 60, 70 years learning how to make really good studios uh, and then it all kind of got thrown out the window. You go into, uh, certainly you go into new broadcasting house in London to the BBC and what you're actually looking at are glass boxes sitting in the middle of a floor uh, without any kind of suspension on the floor. So the vibration of people walking around outside gets transmitted through. I mean, they've, they've done some great things, you know, offsetting the angles of the glass and putting in fancy pillows and things that hang down the back of the, the room and so on. All of that will get you so far, but I don't think it's a substitute for a, a double-walled studio with with double glass and things at the right angles and so on, which is what we used to do. So what I've tried to do in my studio here is approximate that as much as I can. What I wasn't able to do was get somebody who would build me a completely freestanding room within a room. So I do have some issues with with transmitted noise. Um, North Carolina, believe it or not, is subtropical. So when it rains here, it really rains here. And the garage, of course, was never built as a voiceover studio. It was built as a garage, so it has a tin roof. So when the the subtropical rain hits the tin roof, that can be a challenge. Um, So far, I've only had one session where... I've been connecting live to another studio and it's been raining and it's been audible. Um, And on that occasion, I did say, is this going to be a problem? And the engineer on the other end said, no, don't worry, we've already sampled that, we can take it out. So they were way ahead of things. And, And, you know, that takes us into the area of what can you get away with? And I think you can get away with more now than you used to be able to. The right software, the right noise reduction and so on will will help. Uh, and I appreciate the purists everywhere listening to this are now cringing and, and throwing things. Um, <laughs> and I'm not advocating that you go in with, with less than you need. I think you should always build the best studio that you can. Uh, what I'm saying yeah. is if you end up with extenuating circumstances that, that mean that sometimes that studio doesn't sound quite as good as you'd like, there are ways to rescue it now that just didn't exist five years ago or ten years ago. I also have uh, a bit of tin roof in this place as well. It doesn't affect me with rain. It doesn't get in. None of that frequency gets in here. The biggest issue I have um, is low frequency from coaches or trucks or something that go past. Yeah. Mine takes out most of that. I mean, if uh, living in a valley in the mountains in North Carolina, there's always somebody who's got a leaf blower going. There's always somebody who's got a chainsaw going somewhere in the distance. Uh, And I have two windows, one behind the other with a gap of about eight inches between them, and the same with two sliding patio doors. And you close the first one and you can still hear some of that. You close the second one and it's pretty much at a level where you're you're not going to hear it and it's not going to get picked up. And whenever things working at 
ideal levels here, my noise floor is somewhere in the minus 60, minus 70 dBs, which is great. Yeah, um, that's the good. The moment yeah. somebody decides to take out a shotgun and start doing some target practice half a mile away or whatever, <laughs> that can be an issue. Um, but I make it work. And I think that's the other thing. I think expectations are also changing because I think producers appreciate that if you're going to work with people who are working from home studios, they are home studios. Their studio is in somebody's home. And I mean, I'm fortunate here that I don't live in a neighborhood where there are other people around. I don't have people the other side of the wall or upstairs or downstairs or across the street. Um, but a lot of people do. And my impression is that producers are perhaps a little more accommodating of that than we might expect them to be. I must admit, I used, I interviewed George Whittam uh, a couple of weeks back. I actually booked a session with him where I just sent a, a sample of audio from here and he analysed the audio, uh, which was actually really amazing because he picked up on things that I, that I wouldn't have even thought about. Huh. Uh, he said my mic placement was right. He, he, could, he told me exactly where the uh, glass was. <laughs> I gave him samples of different microphones that I have here and different preamps to see which seemed to cut it more than the other. And it was a, it was a fantastic service. But the, the most important thing for me was that he came back and said, sweet, it's good. So mm. it's like, whew, okay. So now I can walk in here with confidence and just get on with the job. And yeah, and I, I think with, with home studios as well, there is, it's like anything high-end. It's like a good bottle of wine or a high-end hi-fi system. There is a law of diminishing returns after a while. You can put endless amounts of money into this stuff. I think they're, they're possibly a little more forgiving. And anything that's coming out of a properly designed and built home studio is always going to sound better than something that's recorded on a USB mic at somebody's kitchen table or in their bedroom. My last question, and the question is, what gear have you got? <sighs> um, well, I currently have a setup that is, uh, the, okay, the mic is, um, it's not the mic I'm talking to you on now because I decided that we would do this from the, the relative comfort of the couch. So uh, I'm talking to you at the moment on a, on a 416 uh, going into a Centrance mic port pro and then going into oh. my laptop, but that's not my normal recording setup. My normal recording setup is a Neumann TLM193, um, which is a microphone that I've met several times over the years in various facilities and production houses and which works very well on my on my voice um it, that, that neumann is that the one that looks like a u87 but it's single single pattern is that the one yeah pretty much it's a little smaller i mean it doesn't have all the all the gubbins inside that a u87 does so it looks it looks a bit like a u87 that's been put on a strict diet um <laughs> But yeah, it has a similar kind of sound, but a lower noise floor because the TLM, um, I think, I think stands for transformerless microphone. Yeah. So the noise floor on it is very low. So it goes TLM 193 into the focus right channel strip. Then it goes into, um, I threw out my mixer when I left London. I didn't want to, to have an analog mixer anymore. I don't do any mixing. Yeah. It was really just a, a, a routing center. So I replaced it with a, a Focusrite Scarlett 18i20, uh, which has a bunch of inputs that I don't use. But what it does do is it gives me the, the orgs channels and things so that I can route things for the phone patch um, or for if I want to do a session on Skype. Um, I can do all of those clean feeds and orgs that I couldn't do on a, on a basic basic interface. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I do use a mixer, I must admit. Well, there's something to be said for waggling a fader now and again. There, there is a, it's a lovely tactile feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and it's old school. And I do, I'm, I must admit, I do like a bit it of old school. It is old school, and I am old school, and I love the analogue technology. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's all changed. I, I learned to drive a desk in the days when it was BBC faders that went the wrong way round, and <laughs> yes, that's carts, right. that's right. and... Yeah. Records that you know you could you played them at the wrong speed sometimes and yep. you know it's thirty years ago now and the, the the world has changed and the landscape has changed and I think there are things from that previous analog time that are worth holding on to and preserving but I think there are also things that you know, you know it was a no brainer really I looked at this huge box that was sitting next to my desk with the mixer with all the wires going in and out of it and I thought you know what. I really don't need this. <laughs> yes. So I chose to get rid. I remember 
and I, th- I think it kind of ties together some of the other stuff that we've talked about. I think there are things that are worth holding on to because they're a great way of doing things. But I think also it's important to realize when there's something better around the corner. I remember I was a dab hand with a China Graph pencil and a razor blade. Oh, and yeah. I remember sitting in a BBC radio studio in whatever it was, 1989, 91, and, th- and, and editing something and hearing how seamless it was and thinking, you know what, we'll never be able to do this with machines. And now <laughs> I edit in Pro Tools. I take out clicks and pops. I can sometimes even take out a word if I've added one in and not even, not even hear that I've done it. Um, yeah, I think sometimes it's 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 good to be nostalgic but on the other hand i think uh employing technology and embracing technology when appropriate can take us to places that we never imagine you've just got to use it correctly because i think um, one of the worst things about technology apart from mp3s which is a pet hate is the, <laughs> the lack of commitment uh it allows you never to commit and i i think that's uh that's that's a downside of technology that's very true but on the other hand Again, if you'd told me a few years ago that I would be able to go to a piece of audio, pull up a spectral display of it, and then paint out the bits that I don't want yes. and have those takeaway sounds without affecting the sounds around them, mm. you know, that kind of voodoo, I'm all for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I, I, do, I, I, I do like technology. I do like analog. And I think if you get a nice combination of both, uh, it's a winner. Well, that's two of us. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> On that note, we should probably uh, either enjoy the evening or go and earn some money. Well, I'll go and enjoy the evening. Your day's just starting, so you go and earn some money. I will. (laughs) We'll chat again soon. (laughs) Beautiful. Thanks, Mike. You're very welcome, Andrew. Talk to you again soon. Cheers. Well, there you go. That's uh, Mike Cooper, based in North Carolina, the British voice. How freaky is that? That same town thing. You, did you guys? You guys didn't know each other back then, obviously. No, because I left there a long time ago. But I was thinking after we did that interview, I reckon I would have been hanging around town when he was living there because uh, I was back in the UK around that period. So, mm. well, there you go. So uh, who knows? Who knows? Isn't that the joy of podcasting, though? Small, yeah. small world. Small, small it is world. a small world. Yeah, I think uh, the internet has certainly uh, made it even smaller. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, that was a great interview. We should probably try go away and try and come up with an idea for something to do next week. <laughs> that's not a bad idea, in fact. <laughs> that's a great idea. Now we've just got to think of another idea that people might be interested in hearing. That's all right. Yeah. We'll figure something out. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to go and squeeze a pencil and think. <laughs> The VO Radio Show is produced in the studios of Voodoo Sound. To polish your next audio production, check us out at voodoo-sound.com. Find professional voices simply all in one place. Realtimecasting.com, including me.